Welcome to the committee, Chief. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you for allowing me the time today and thank you for the work that's been put into the bill. Uh, let me first start by saying I've served as an officer here in the state of Idaho for the past 23 years. I am an absolute supporter of the Second Amendment to the Constitution and the right to care and bear and carry arms here in the state of Idaho as well as concealed carry in the permitting system that we have. It's been a very effective system, although I know it's got some issues and the language has some challenges that absolutely need fixed. And this bill does fix some of those issues that we've had in the past. However, I remain with some strong concerns in the way the bill is written now and how it might have both un the unintended effects it might have on an officer's ability to do their jobs and some of the safety issues. I'll hit some of the high points. The 18-year-old changing the language from may to shall for a sheriff. I believe that there are some rural sheriffs that are very well in touch with their community and that this is going to take away some of the protections they're able to um, have for children, for a, for a youth that might be making bad decisions. I can see, a, for example, an 18-year-old high school student, severe bullying situation. Either they're scared or they're the bully, and or maybe there's a little mental instability and a sheriff saying, I'm not going to grant that right now. I don't want to. Under this bill, the, the sheriffs would not have the choice. They would have to grant that um, permit to the child. The uh, ability to deal with out-of-state, out-of-county felons. There are some states that have statewide information systems that are shared between all law enforcement. We do not have that. As our NRA rep pointed out, one of the, uh, the areas he pointed out is what we would use would be a triple I, which is a national NCIC index. It's an interstate identification index. However, officers are not able to run that in the field by themselves. They have to contact somebody and they have to have somebody in a records or a jail that's got access to an actual terminal to run that anywhere in the state. Nobody has that ability. To do that, there has to be a nexus to criminal activity. An officer can't choose to just run one of those. If there is no assumed reason to have a permit, the person doesn't have a permit with them, I, I see some significant legal challenges coming our way, and the FBI, for instance, saying that's not a legal use of our triple I system under an NCIC for an officer to even run that check. If we had it, a system with shared information, a system like Florida, and that had been funded and, and implemented within the state, that concern would certainly go away. But right now, an officer's ability to check that index would be very limited. I also worry about the residency uh, without being defined and tied. That's certainly a simple fix within this bill, but it should be identified as to which residency requirement we're going to use. In law enforcement, obviously, we operate under several different, depending on which code or enforcement avenue that we're taking from the legislation that's currently in place also an officer's ability to determine that residency. So without any type of a background check, are we going to go off the statement or are we going to have any ability to really look to see what that is? What that takes us to is an inability for an officer to really implement the law as written. I completely agree that the, um, the concept of somebody taking their coat on or coat off is an issue of, of concern for our citizenry when they come into a city and they've got a concealed weapon. However, I will tell you, our crimes in the city, I've never had a offense committed by somebody that was doing an open carry. It's somebody that's carrying a concealed weapon. Um, the Terry versus Ohio, as was mentioned, is actually a significant concern. Terry versus Ohio has two elements. One is a suspicion that the person is dangerous. You've got to be, have an articulable suspicion that the person is dangerous. Another, that a crime has occurred or is about to occur. Certainly, if we take the element of having a concealed weapon and making that perfectly legal for anybody in that state, that weakens any Terry versus Ohio approach an officer would take. Um, another section of the law which I've come to have concerns with as I've reviewed it is the lack of a check, a lack of a background, which happens now under the current system of permitting for somebody that might be severely mentally ill, a narcotics, um, a narcotic analgesic, I'm sorry, um, addiction that's severe. And when I say narcotic analgic, analgesics, we're talking about drugs like heroin. So under the current law, that's illegal. You cannot receive a um, concealed weapons permit. You can't, the, the same logic which has been presented today, you can't, can't legally carry, those elements are still within the law. So whether you're an, an addict, you have a severe mental illness, which might make you a danger to society, you're a convicted felon, all of those are contained still within the language, 
but there's no realistic way for an officer to implement that in the field. Now, if you happen to be individually familiar with the person that's carrying the weapon illegally, certainly an officer can take action. If you have another crime which the person has committed and you're able to obtain a triple I and get the information that the person is a convicted felon out of state or some other county within the state, you can take action. Most officers in the vast majority of stops will not have that ability. I believe that the current concealed weapons permit language is working. I believe that it could be improved. I would love to have an effort to improve that language, but I would like it to be a reasoned, open, and time-focused where implementation was something that would not negatively affect the safety of our community or the safety of our police officers. And I would ask that the committee would vote no today and take that time until the bill can be crafted to address those concerns. I would stand for questions. Are there any questions for Chief Bones? I see none at this time. Thank you, Chief, for being here today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Committee. Would the Senate page in the back, would you see if there's anyone else who signed up to testify and bring the sheet forward? All right. Um, next is Lonnie Pfeiffer. And um, until I see if there's anyone else signed up, Con, we will have pros. So if you can just kind of state your name and what... Um, and maybe something that someone else hasn't said that you'd like to state. Okay. Okay, thank you for being here. You're welcome, and thank you for having me. My name is Lonnie Pfeiffer, and I am a resident of the state of Idaho. Um, first, I just want to start with a little observation that I've made just while sitting in here. Um, while I have no doubt that those here opposing this legislation truly feel the emotions they argue with, I heard nothing from them that would seem legitimate cause to abort a constitution that has served this country so well for so long. I have also noticed that all, nearly all, who came to oppose this legislation have had their say and walked out the door without bothering to sit and listen to any logic come from the other side. That's just an observation. Um, there was one gentleman earlier that made the comment about Gun ownership being a privilege and not a right, that is absolutely not true. We all know that the right is stated in the Constitution of the United States. And with that, I've just got a little note here I would like to read. <clears throat> is this um, from something that you'd like to no, identify? No, this is, this what is, it is my... It? This is you? Okay. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. I've just got a few sentences that I would like everyone in this room to ponder for a moment. The first one, I assume everyone here is quite familiar with. If not, they probably shouldn't be in this room to begin with. The next few are formatted and structured exactly the same as the first, only a few of the verbs and nouns have been replaced. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Okay, we've all heard that a few times, right? Right about now, we're probably all about tired of hearing that. But I would ask you to consider it from a different perspective. I'd like to shine a slightly different light on it, if you will, if you will bear with me. Now, despite the fact the United States Supreme Court has already addressed this issue at least once in the District of Columbia versus Heller and found only the same thing that I am reminding you of here, there are those who, who would have you believe that the mere presence of the word words well-regulated militia in the first part of this phrase somehow negate or intrude upon the rights of the individual spelled out in the second part of that sentence. So I've taken all the hyperbole and political charge out of that sentence and present, it with, present you with these examples to ponder. Please note again that the structure, format, and direction of these sentences are exactly the same, only the subject has changed. A well-trained team, a well-trained team being necessary to the birth of a playoff, the right of the children to have and to carry baseball shall not be infringed. Now my question is this, how many of you construed this last sentence to mean that a child must already belong to a team in order to carry his ball in his pocket on the way to the park in order to enjoy a game of catch with his buddies? Or how about this? A well-informed news bureau being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear cameras shall not be infringed. Do you read this to mean that you have to be employed by a news station, a newspaper, 
or a new television station in order to record and report the, the events that happen around you? While the sentence structure and, and instruction are precisely the same, what I've done is changed most of the active player words. You'll notice, however, that I kept the operative word infringed. The choice of this word in that document was not critical, or was critical, and they knew this. They didn't tell us that this is a right may not be abolished or that this right may not be defeated. They meant exactly what they wrote, infringed. Intentionally prohibiting any compromises to this most crucial and basic human right. I would put forth that, the, that only the most dangerous type of manipulative, manipulative in, excuse me, the most dangerous type of manipulative, individuals, pardon me folks, I've kind of lost my place here. Anyway, the only people that would, that would try to give you this, this kind of logic that I've described here are um, the same type of people who would stand here in front of a court and question what the, what the definition of is is. You know, infringed means exactly what you think it means. Um, For anyone to say that that child in my example or that amateur photographer, you cannot carry that ball or that camera in your backpack, for instance, would certainly be an infringement upon their rights to carry that ball or that camera. Likewise, for anyone to say that child, you must have a permission slip from your mother in order to carry that ball or to say to that photographer, you must have a media badge in order to carry that camera would also certainly be an infringement. Remember, we're not here talking about children, we're not talking about games though. We're here talking about full-fledged adults and the right to defend their lives and the lives of their children. I hear members of this legislature, of this legislature con continually claiming that in Idaho, we take the Constitution serious. <coughs> and they're right, the vast majority of Idahoans do take the Constitution seriously. And here's, now here's your chance to prove that by passing this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? <coughs> Thank you for being here. Doug Davina is here in support but does not wish to testify. And Paula Davina? <coughs> Welcome to the committee, Paula. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Committee members, I have concealed carry permits in two states. I very seldom even think about a gun because in Idaho, probably the person sitting next to me has one. Everything, I think, on both sides has already been said, so I would like to just thank you for your considerable consideration of everyone in allowing them to have a chance to speak. Thank you, Paula. And also, Lori Thomas and Scott Solders are here in support. Next, we have Mike Kane. Welcome to the committee, Mike. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the Sheriff's Association has voted in support of this bill, and I'm here to pass that on to you. I'm going to speak to one thing that hasn't been spoken to today. There's a very important component to this bill, and that is that it claws back on a significant uh, mistake we all made last year. And uh, currently, the law allows felons, uh, the adjudicated mentally ill, fugitives, illegal aliens, to carry concealed weapons outside of city limits. And this claws that back, and uh, we thank you for, for doing that. It's been my signature issue of the session, as many of you know. And uh, I'll stand for questions. Thank you very much. Any questions for Mr. Kane? Thank you. I see none. Thank you very much. <clears throat> 